Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sean Cruzen, Executive Director of Columbus State University's Coca-Cola Space Science Center, and this is a special edition of This Week in Space Science. And we have a very special guest with us to here today. Uh, we have Dr. Bernard Harris, uh, a twice space flyer and the first African American to walk in space. And also we have my good friend, Mr. Scott Norman, the uh, Director of Columbus State University's Coca-Cola Space Science Center, Challenger Learning Center, and our staff space historian. So we're going to be talking to Dr. Harris today and, uh, and talking to him about some of his adventures in outer space, as well as uh, the state of STEM education right here on Earth. So first of all, I'm going to turn this over to Scott. I'm going to let Scott ask uh, Dr. Harris a few questions about what it was like to be an astronaut. Well, Dr. Harris, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, let's start off by asking you about how you became interested in space in the first place. What made you want to be an astronaut? Well, I got inspired very so much a lot of kids uh, back in the 70s and uh, really 60s and 70s. And it was when I saw Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon. And uh, I decided I wanted to follow in their footsteps. Just as simple as that. Yeah, I think that inspired a lot of yep. people. I know that, that yep. spiked my interest in space, yep. watching those Apollo moon landings. Now, I know on your second flight on STS-63, uh, was one of the flights uh, to the uh, Mir space station. In fact, it was the first mission to go up and rendezvous uh, close to the Mir station. You also had a Russian cosmonaut on board, Vladimir yeah. Titov. Could you talk a little bit about what it was like, uh, you know, two countries that for many years during the Cold War had been adversaries, suddenly uh, finding themselves working together in their space programs jointly. What were some of the challenges or, or difficulties maybe to overcome with that? Yeah. Yeah, so certainly, you know, the Cold War had ended, uh, our relationships with uh, Russia had, uh, had warmed, and part of that warmth was NASA's involvement in, in the space program. And for me, it just made sense that uh, we shouldn't be going into space uh, separately, that this is one Earth, and we're one people, and we ought to be exploring, you know, the solar system and the galaxy in, in that way. So I was very pleased to be part of part of that mission. Uh, but with that said, we knew that early on that there were differences, cultural differences between the Russian people and the American people. So naturally, as a crew and I think as an agency, we were kind of concerned, of, you know, how it's all this come together. Uh, the Russian that was selected to be on our mission was Vladimir Titov, as you said who didn't speak very much English at the time, and none of our crew members spoke Russian, although we were trying to learn a few, few words, and we were concerned about, okay, can we really train not knowing each other's language? And what we found was an astronaut is an astronaut. And uh, it was, uh, it, it were a lot of things that we do, we just do because we've been trained that way. So right. it was very easy to, to really put the two together. Probably the most difficult aspect of it was the travel back and forth between the U.S. and, and, uh, and Russia, which we had to do quite often. Well, I know that, uh, of course, uh, being a medical doctor, one of your specialties is uh, adapting to the space mm -hmm. in environment, doing research into that. Could you tell us a little bit about what are some of the problems and hazards of, of being in the space environment, not only microgravity, but radiation, just some of the things that you've been working on to develop countermeasures uh, to. and how do you think that might relate to uh, distant, more distant travel, like going to Mars in the future? Yep. Biomedical aspects mm -hmm. of that. Well, you know, I got into this business because I'm a physician, and I actually have a, a research fellowship in endocrinology, studying bone loss as it occurs in space. There's a whole condition called space adaptation syndrome, and it just sort of describes or encompasses all the things that happen to the human body when we go into space. For example, we lose 1% of bone per month. We lose about 15 to 20% of our muscle mass, depending on the length of time in which we spend in space. Our heart actually shrinks in size because we have a reduction in our total blood volume because we don't need as much blood uh, in space as we do here on Earth because of, of gravity. And so a lot of changes are involved uh, there. And it's my job as a group medical officer to you know, develop uh, equipment to analyze astronauts in space and then bring that back down to figure out what's good at adaptation and what's bad adaptation and then that we deem bad to develop countermeasures for and the best countermeasure we have for all of that is exercise mm. so we spent years developing treadmills that can operate in zero gravity we uh, spent years in developing devices that simulate weightlifting 
so we use electric motors to do resistive exercise. We also have a bicycle ergometer, of course, stationary bike that uh, simulates riding a, a bike. And uh, every astronaut has to spend at least one hour and in the International Space Station, two hours a day of exercise wow. in order to try to uh, diminish the effect that microgravity has, mm -hmm. on, has on the body. Wow, okay. Yeah. So how do you think uh, what you've learned as far as the biomedical effects of, of being in space, how would that relate to like a longer, longer voyage? Yeah. I mean, I've heard uh, up to 500 days possibly yeah. for a round trip voyage to the planet Mars. Yeah. Uh, so how will being in space for that amount of time, you think, affect the human body? I mean, can, can we physiologically or even psychologically yeah. stand uh, a voyage uh, like that? So I, I think that we can, uh, but I think trying to do a 500 day mission to me it uh, doesn't make sense from the standpoint of its effect on the body. Mm -hmm. We know that we can stay in space uh, up to about 422 days. That's the longest time in which a human being has, has done and come back and not have a lot of, of, of issues to, to deal with. I think if you're staying up there for 500 days, then I think all bets are off. We do have the technology to do this uh, in less than three years. And mm -hmm. so the, the uh, scenarios in which NASA uh, looks at is kind of a three-year mission. In fact, using a new uh, propulsion system called plasma uh, energy, we're able to, to reduce the year trip down to three to six months getting there. And then whatever time we were spent on the surface in Mars, and then uh, you know, maybe another uh, year or so getting back. So really three years, I think, is where we want to be. Uh, at three years, I think we can, can develop uh, enough countermeasures to, uh, you know, to allow people to function. Now, with that caveat, I have to tell you this, that if you're on your way to Mars and there is a solar flare, uh, if we don't have any way in which to shield the vehicle, then the crew will be in trouble. Right. Yeah. Right. So what, what, are, well, what are some ways that uh, we, we can mitigate maybe that radiation risk? I mean, what, what are some types of shielding or there are countermeasures yeah. or things that we can take to do that? Yeah, there's, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest way is to get there faster. You don't oh, want right. to be hanging around uh, because the longer you're traveling in space. So, so just reducing the, the travel reducing, time is one of the best things right, to exactly, do. Exactly, reducing the risk. The other is that uh, we are, uh, there are ways in which you can block some of this radiation. Uh, but not all of it. Uh, when you have galactic radiation, high energy particles, it basically goes through anything. People naturally think that why don't we just shield it with lead or shield it with uh, aluminum or, or some type of metal. Well, that's uh, when high energy particles hit material like that, it produces secondary radiation. And in producing right. a secondary radiation, it uh, causes, it's like being in the middle of an x-ray machine, so you don't oh, want so to do that. that's not good. That's not good. <laughs> so w the thought is water is a great uh, absorber, but you need a lot of it. And hydrogen, pure hydrogen, is a, is a good absorber, uh, although it doesn't capture everything. So the, some notions have said, put a habitation module and surround it by the fuel, the hydrogen fuels. And so, as an astronaut, that's not very appealing to us because that's like sitting in the middle of a bomb. <laughs> but I think it will be okay. Well, by the way, we use hydrogen and oxygen as, as a fuel for, our, our, for the shuttle. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Harris, you're, you're here on Columbus State University's campus today as, as part of a, a, a larger day where we're, we're celebrating um, uh, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We're trying to encourage students to go into that field. And of course, tonight will be the Hunter Lecture where you'll be addressing the public. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts about some of the barriers that prevent students from pursuing careers in STEM fields today? Well, I'll tell you, one of the big barriers for the United States is our kids are not graduating from high school. Mm -hmm. uh, about 30% of our young people are failing to graduate from high school. And if you're a minority, uh, that's African American or Hispanic Latino, that uh, increases to about 43 to 45 percent. So if you think about uh, a nation now that has a very large minority population and looking forward, that's the first step, is that how do we get our young people to finish high school, right? Uh, because those that finish high school are the ones that come to universities like you know, Columbus State. 
And so we, want, we need to encourage that. Once we get here, they get here, we need to make sure that they are going into fields that are relevant for the 21st century. Uh, we've talked about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And so it is important that we try to, uh, if the kids are not majoring in that, the students are not majoring in those particular fields, that at least they had that aptitude so that they can get the jobs that, as I said before, they're relevant for the 21st century. In terms of that relevance, do you think the traditional degrees that we have and the traditional science programs we have, do you, do you foresee a change in those science programs over time or a melding of any of those kinds of science programs so that they're, they're more appropriate for, uh, for the future generations? Yeah, I think we have to adapt. I think one of the biggest uh, changes in higher education is this notion of online learning. Mm -hmm. And I think every university has had to step up. Uh, I think 20 years ago when this first came about, uh, universities were saying, well, you know, kids need to be, or students need to be on campus with a professor right in front of them. And, and certainly that is important, uh, a pr important aspect of education. But now we have so much more ways in which students can access education. And more importantly, how education can access the students. And so I think we need to look at how we how we are, are teaching our, our young people. Uh, again, I go back to this relevancy. You know, when I was in school, when I was in undergraduate school almost 40 years ago now, uh, we were learning in a different way. There was no internet. There were no smartphones or cell phones, at least cell phones that look like the cell right. phones that we have right now, <laughs> and certainly didn't have that, that capability that these have now. Now we have many different ways in which to access it. That we didn't have uh, social media. Social media were the parties we went to <laughs> in school. That was about it. And now we have young people on Twitter and Facebook and uh, and uh, uh, texting. And so we need to use those tools that are available to us now as an as an outreach to the young folks. It's certainly a changing time in terms of technology. And, and you know, one, one of the things that we face as college professors is we weren't born in that time of technology, yeah. so staying current for us yeah. is something that, that was, is vitally important, but also is, is a bit demanding at times. And so, so I, I can certainly see where that is a, a need on our end yeah. to, to bring that technology forward. Yeah. You know, what, one of the other things that our conference today is focusing on is partnerships between higher education and industry. Mm -hmm. and, and do you see those as a valuable kind of a, a cooperative groups to, to then bring along the next generation into those kinds of fields. Definitely, definitely. You have to have that, right? It, it's important for us to make sure that the majors that we have at our, on our campuses uh, relate to the jobs that they are going to be uh, going after because there's a lot of money being spent in higher education right now. Uh, students are coming out with large you know, bills in, in the, and so they have to pay those loans back and the only way you can do that is to get into, into jobs, uh, viable jobs. Uh, the people who can identify those jobs, appropriate jobs, are those folks who own the companies, the corporations, uh, the Microsofts, the Intels, the Exxon Mobiles. Uh, they know where the jobs are, and they know what skill sets that they need, and uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to go and to form those partnerships and, in order for us to develop curriculum uh, that, that, that the kids can relate to and that they can get jobs. That's fantastic. And that's one of the things that we're hoping happens today is, is an outshoot yeah. of our conference that we're having today. Yeah. One last question for yeah. you. In, in the last 10 years, there's been a remarkable uh, surge of commercial space flight. Mm -hmm. so, so something that sounded like science fiction a mere decade ago is now not no longer just not science fiction, but it's actually happening. Commercial space flights are having a lot of success. Where do you see that industry growing? And, and, and in what ways do you see the future of space flight? So I, I'm really excited to, uh, about what's happening. And I'm, I'm extremely excited to hear that, that you didn't ask me the question, what, what do I do now that the space program is over? Because <laughs> yeah. that's what most people think. <laughs> and the space program is, is not over. We are moving from a government-led effort uh, just in low Earth orbit, because uh, what we're doing in, as far as space exploration and you know Moon and Mars and beyond still resides with, within NASA and within space agencies. But this 
journey from the Earth to low Earth orbit, which is around 250 miles above, above the Earth, uh, we have been doing for 30, 40 years now. And as a industry, it is time to let private industry begin to develop those vehicles. And now I think you're going to see, as you've mentioned, this, this blossom effect of more companies being involved. If you have more than one way to get uh, to low Earth orbit, to the International Space Station, where now you can bring up different types of experiments, you develop this ecosystem between the Earth and low Earth orbit, and you develop the industry. And so I think there are going to be plenty of jobs. I think that if you're in school today and you're in college today, you can look forward to uh, being a part of the aerospace and space industry that's going to be blossoming here over the next 10 to 15 years. That's fantastic. It sounds yeah. like a very exciting future. I'm excited about it. I am too. I am too. Well, Dr. Harris, thank you for coming today. We, we really appreciate you coming to Columbus State University and being a part of this great day. And uh, thank you all for watching Columbus State TV, and uh, we'll see you next time on This Week in Space Science.